Hey, welcome to the exchange. Let's take a look at Kathy Wood's Big Ideas 2022. I want to take a look at what's going on behind the scenes, how she views the world, her overall investment philosophy, and what it really means for the future for all investors. So this is uh, Kathy Wood's Big Ideas 2022 from ARK Invest. It, it publishes every uh, year, and usually in January timeframe, basically looking at their overall investment kind of thesis for all these various interest sectors. Let's dive into the interest sectors and kind of see what's going on. Um, so really what she does, the big idea here is basically this idea of convergence, the idea there of synergy between these various technologies. So as you can see here between cloud computing, AI, IoT devices, you know, digital walls, et cetera, all these things accelerating individually, but together they base almost like a Lollapalooza effect where it's a combined synergy where all of a sudden you have basically a greater gains in some of the parts. So she also has a TAMS in there, basically total adjustable market values. These are all you know speculative, and you might be like, hey, this is total total crap. I absolutely understand that though too. But I mean, these areas are going to grow. That's almost almost undeniable. Um, but the question is how fast and how far they're going to grow. I mean, she's obviously looking almost at the long case, the, the very strong bull case. But she may not be wrong though too. And that's what's very exciting. This whole the whole sector. But let's dive into it real fast. Let's look at first AI, the first sector she actually mentioned. So this right here is the AI revolution. The whole idea behind AI is the idea of cost of training a model, like literally training a smart model is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So you see from 2015, and we're looking at almost a billion dollars in training value. I'm saying by 2030 potentially, I mean, it could be as low as under $1,000, which is an absolutely crazy amount of growth or basically cost uh, declines. Right now, we're about a you know, little over you know, three, four, five million dollars. That's kind of what you're seeing right now, um, according to Kathy Wood. But I mean, it's, it's going to keep dropping according to um, according to Moore's law or Wright's law. But I mean, Moore's law is much slower. Wright's law is much much faster. But either way, even in the median there, it is going to get much much cheaper by 2030 time frame. So this is the actual hardware training cost. This is basically AI training hardware. So the whole idea here is again, it's logarithmic uh, curve right here. So you can see at the log scale and the vertical axis right here. But it's a, it's a linear curve right now on the log scale. Um, basically, what it's saying is, hey. Hardware costs are going to be dropping overall. So it's you know if you're a small startup, a small system developer, even a guy in his garage, I mean the cost of training hard, cost of training AI is going to get much much cheaper on the hardware you actually have. The hardware you actually need is going to be much much cheaper um, overall. Uh, let's look like training costs versus neural networks is again it's same same story there. So the actual uh, the inputs versus outputs are get much much more uh, efficient overall. So another thing I want to highlight too is also the actual uh, growth rates on spending side. So really what we're seeing right now in the kind of the consensus view is a 4% CAGR, which is compounded annual growth rate there. What Kathy Wood is seeing is really a 20% uh, CAGR, basically growth rate. Really accelerating 2025, 2026, almost that S curve start taking off right there. But I mean, really what she's seeing is almost a $15 trillion, basically additional accretive spend on top of the actual forecasted IT budgets. This is for all uh, IT kind of software AI companies across the board. So I mean, if that happens, I mean, she might be absolutely right. And this whole total TAM, the total adjustable market value of AI and the hardware side might be much, much larger than people are actually taking credit for. So next, this idea of digital wallets right here. So really, the idea of like taking your wallet, taking out the credit card, having basically a digital app, basically software-based uh, overall wallet economy right there. Um, and really, what's changing is like in the U.S., we're a little bit behind actually. Look at like China and overseas, even emerging countries. I mean, digital wallets are much, much more entrenched than they are in the U.S. Um, we just love our cash, we love our credit cards, etc. That's kind of what we know. But I mean, globally, this is going to change, and this it has been changing. But you can see right here the purple line. This is the digital wallets. This is in 2020. This is almost 45 percent. So I mean, the, most of the world is majority in digital wallets right now as for, as, a, uh, as payment methods for e-commerce, etc. When we shop online or shop, you know, even in person, we use digital wallets. Um, but what we're seeing right here is really the first time is digital wallets actually surpass credit cards, debit cards, cash as a main purchasing mechanism uh, for global point of sale systems, which I mean, this is again, this is not going to go away. This trend's going to keep continuing. I don't see how it's going to change, but the idea of pulling out a credit card, pulling out your cash, I mean, it's, just, it's annoying. It slows down the line. It slows down the payment kind of velocity for, for retailers. So they want to use digital wallets, whether it's scanning QR codes, paying online, paying through the app, et cetera. I mean, it's going to keep accelerating as money gets more decentralized across all these various applications and software platforms. But let's take a look at next. Um, this is the actual kind of the digital wallet ecosystem right now. So what you have most commonly, what you know about is peer to peer. So like your cash apps, your Venmo's. Um, these are kind of your land expand. So they have a trusted banking, banking relationships. And from there, they cross sell products so like your new banks, your Momo's, etc. cetera. Uh, vertical, vertical integration and financial services basically is looking at like your WeChat. So kind of your Chinese super apps, you know, et cetera. Those are kind of where those kind of go in where it's almost a one stop shop. For banking, lending, mortgages, auto loans, personal loans, whatever you might need. It's basically a one-stop app right there. And then lastly, you have the merchant first apps. This is kind of your more legacy systems or more legacy competitors trying to get in the actual, uh, basically the fintech space with some of these startup apps, et cetera. Um, but it is, this ecosystem is going to keep growing and growing and growing. That's where I think, I mean, I definitely see this ecosystem growing in the, you know, in the 2030 and beyond because I mean, the future is going to be, you know, it's going to be digital. It's going to be digital walls, et cetera. And that's what Kathy Wood does know. And I mean, it's definitely going to keep continuing. This is one of the things where I think it's a, 
a safer bet for her for overall innovation. The question is, some of these companies like Cash App with Square or Block, the question is, are they overvalued at this point, though, too? And that's really the question you have to ask as a personal investor. So this idea that she has, basically, where digital wallets could scale 69% uh, annual rate. It's basically going from $400 billion right now to $5.7 trillion in 2026. So, I mean, on a five-year growth rate, and that is absolutely incredible growth. It's almost like a startup growth, that level of growth. The question is, can they maintain that overall? I mean, if we look at the overall, if we have the reinsurance market, the investing market, the Web 3.0 uh, market with these digital wallets, I mean, it's possible, though. But, I mean, this is a very, I think, very, very aggressive timeline. Um, I mean, she really sees it as a $5.7 trillion opportunity, but I mean, this might be a little aggressive, but I mean, she's definitely right that it's definitely going to grow. The growth rate is going to be there. But the question is, is it going to be this high? And that's really the question you have to ask yourself as an investor into kind of digital wallet ecosystem. Hey, but next let's, let's talk the actual blockchain. It's public blockchain. So like your Bitcoin, your Ethereum network, et cetera. Um, and really the big thing here, if you don't know the blockchain that well, basically, and we have traditional institutions on the left-hand side. It's so like your Visa, JP Morgan, Federal Reserve, et cetera. And this is the idea of settlement. Uh, custody and asset management, and then obviously Federal Reserve's monetary policy of the entire U.S. Uh, market overall. And the idea of Bitcoin or any, really any kind of crypto network is basically takes all these uh, various processes, combines them into one actual overarching layer. It's, it's permissionless, so anyone can join it. Um, it's, I mean, it has its set governance already in place based on the actual code behind the scenes. Um, but basically it takes an entire kind of like these all these various stakeholders and come out into one the idea there is a centralized kind of governance platform that basically no one can break it's the idea that you can't you know change the system overall without consensus overview across the entire uh, blockchain uh, blockchain network but i mean it's it's really this idea of taking this status quo of centralized infrastructure and all of a sudden decentralizing it making open source making it user base etc i mean you can you can really argue whether it's decentralized or not i mean and honestly right now we are but the question is in the future it may get more make it more and more centralized as it gets more and more adopted by institutions institutional investors and overall just the world in general so this is an interesting slide and this kind of shows like long-term vision of the, the, really the whole crypto community if you're a crypto bull um, but really, it's kind of taking an idea of like legacy internet kind of uh, systems and really put them on the, on the blockchain. So the idea there is you have cryptocurrencies, obviously, which are store value, store wealth, etc. Uh, crypto equities. So the idea of like you know clearing equities or showing you know ownership of your equities, saying hey, I can prove I'm the owner of one share of Apple because it's on the blockchain, etc. Or if we trade, let's say hey, I trade you an Apple share, you give me cash, etc. It has that basically that counterparty risk is almost nil just because it's guaranteed on the blockchain. So you know, hey, I'm gonna get paid because I can I can see that John Doe out there has the cash and he, he sees I have the actual Apple share, etc. That's all on the blockchain. And, and it's all like it's all in public uh, view, et cetera. Uh, crypto commodities is the idea of like supply chain management, so like oil, gas, nickel, et cetera. Um, the idea of like, hey, you can actually track your commodities through a supply chain, or you can verify, hey, that John Doe out there has you know, f you know, 400 tons of nickel, et cetera, and basically verified on the blockchain because it's the architecture, et cetera. Um, which this is early phase though for supply chain, but it's definitely a, a good way to really track your actual supply chain kind of routing and make sure there's no like actual laundering of various you know precious metals or blood diamonds or anything else, et cetera, by having to be on the actual blockchain itself. Uh, crypto art NFTs is really as well as the digital assets, and it's 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 early phase right now. And NFTs have been on a downswing the past few months, but I mean the idea of digital assets, especially in the Web 3.0 world, it does make sense. And the you know, question is like. Where are those assets actually going to sit at? Where are they going to go? How are you going to display those assets in basically a metaverse or Web 3.0 world, et cetera? Um, it's still a very early phase. And obviously DAOs, if you don't know DAOs, we'll, we'll get to those later. But uh, it's another uh, good use for the blockchain for overall, kind of almost like almost like decentralized kind of corporations in an aspect. So this is actually one of the most important slides, the entire deck overall. So this is really looking at the actual uh, money revolution. So like your Bitcoin network, a little bit of your Ethereum network. And really you have a status quo on the far right. So like your Visa network, your Amazon, you know, e-commerce, Fedwire, et cetera. Um, also the US dollar itself, but really the sexy part, the exciting part is actually the app layer. It's kind of layer two over here, which is like your Solanas, your Avalanches, maybe your Binance Smart Chain, et cetera. And these are really the idea of taking this Bitcoin network or basically crypto network, and then from that combining with contracts, um, like, again, like was mentioned earlier, of the idea of like settlements, et cetera, or, or supply chain commodities, the idea of having a contract where it's you do XYZ project, you receive XYZ cryptocurrency in exchange for that commitment, et cetera. And that's a really good idea of smart contracts. And it's really what's, this is very, very, very early phase. You want to say like Bitcoin as a whole is, you know, and even Ethereum too, are almost legacy, kind of the older kind of dinosaurs in the room compared to the actual, uh, basically the app layer contracts, et cetera. And this is like you know, Solana's Avalanche's Terrace. Now these might not take off. These are almost like startups where it's, hey, the very early phase. I mean, this is almost like early believers still. I mean, even like if you're, if you're inter entering the crypto universe, you're going to buy Bitcoin, you're going to buy Ethereum, et cetera. You're probably not going to buy the Solana's Avalanche's Terrace of the world. You may not buy like USD for example too but I mean this is one of those things where hey three four five years from now this might be the future potentially for a lot of various you know settlements or and or supply chain issues across the world
Okay, so next let's take a look at the Ethereum and DeFi network. DeFi, if you don't know, is decentralized finance. Um, really what the idea here is taking this idea of centralized finance on the left hand side, see so traditional finance like Bank of America, New York Stock Exchange, Robinhood, BlackRock, et cetera. Basically putting them on the actual, those functions, kind of their, their roles on the actual crypto networks themselves here. So what you really see here in the DeFi world is these various the tools or cryptocurrencies or basically apps be able to use the same kind of overall effects um, and use those on the cryptocurrency network themselves to actually achieve those reinsurance or change equities or have banking lending, et cetera. And that's really the idea behind the kind of you know, the DeFi and also the uh, NFTs in general. But it also is really built on the Ethereum network itself. So you can really see it right here and see kind of the uh, DeFi summer, you know, the NFT kind of rise. And really it's driven the Ethereum network pretty high overall too, as well as Bitcoin too, because Bitcoin's its largest other player in the market too. Um, but Ethereum is well, it's really unique though too because it has a contract layer. We can actually build contracts on top of the actual uh, Ethereum network itself or spin off entire new cryptocurrencies backed by Ethereum network itself. Um, so it's one of those things where it, it makes sense um, long term. It's still very, very highly, you know, highly, highly volatile. Ethereum itself is, a, is pretty stable right now just because it has all these things backing it, all these you know, institutional money and as well as investors and all these new, other new contract kind of you know, overall startups, etc. Uh, back in it but i mean behind the scenes though too if all, all this basically spun off you know nft projects or spun off cryptocurrency networks off the ethereum network itself it's it's a very very volatile but I mean, overall i mean if if it's partially right i mean it's going to make sense for uh, an investor to kind of invest in early and we, st we still are very very early phases i mean it's still like hey first inning maybe second inning at most but, i mean it's still very early in the overall in the cryptocurrency uh basically ethereum network space um, one challenge of Ethereum Network though, too is the actual gas tax fee. So if you don't know, um, doing transactions on the blockchain itself requires a fee or a tax. It's almost like a transaction fee. Um, for Bitcoin, it's not that bad. It's under ten dollars right now. But for Ethereum, it's highly, highly volatile, and it's you know forty, fifty bucks. Which again, if you're doing a million dollars in Ethereum, it's not really a big deal. But if you're doing like hey five hundred bucks or a thousand bucks, this is a massive, massive tax. And this is what the idea of you see like layer two uh, cryptocurrencies come on the chain, like Avalanche, Solana, etc., have much, much lower fees or much higher bandwidths per uh, per block. So basically, you can get your you basically your your assets move from from block to block or or chain to chain, etc., by using much, much lower fees. And that's really the idea there. And that's one of those things where back in the day, you know, pre-2020, when Ethereum and Bitcoin are not that, I guess, you know, mainstream adapted, these fees didn't matter as much because there were a couple pennies at most. Now they're getting starting to get real dollars. And that's why you're starting to see new cryptocurrencies pop up all the time, trying to lower these fees to get more optimized for transactions. But let's take a look here at the actual... Um, Stable coins. This is one area where it's, you have to be very, very careful. So it's almost like a money market mutual or money market, uh, money market funds. So when you have like a brokerage account, like an E Trade or you know some other uh, Charles Schwab, etc., out there, the idea is that if you hold cash in your actual brokerage account, you actually don't hold cash. You hold money market funds. Which a money market fund is a peg currency. It's usually it's, it's pegged to one dollar. So they buy or sell assets to make sure that peg remains at one dollar. Stable coins, the exact same way, uh, the exact same idea there too. I mean, they've massively grown in value. So you see the majority of the debt in the DeFi world is on stable coins. So it's almost like their version of cash, uh, basically for the for the debt, which is totally fine. But the problem is though. In highly volatile periods, like in the U.S. markets for uh, for money market funds, they can what they call break the buck, basically change off that one dollar mark, go to ninety nine cents or ninety eight cents or maybe one oh two. Um, it, it creates a very strong challenge there too, because in the day they're backed by the Federal Reserve and the federal government. They will actually adapt those to actually like either let the bank fail, get absorbed, get acquired, etc. In crypto world, if it's decentralized, there's no Federal Reserve. So if they break the buck in stable coins, all of a sudden you have basically a capital flight, panic, fear, basically a bank run with no Federal Reserve behind the scenes to actually back up the actual uh, stable coins. And all of a sudden you have basically a currency or basically a network collapse entirely, which is stable coins themselves. There's multiple of them, though, too. But the DeFi network, the DeFi projects they actually back could actually collapse along with them, though, too. So, I mean, I think it's something we might see in the, in the future. And I'm not saying now, but even in the next 10, 15 years, you might see a stable coin break the bug, and all of a sudden you have basically a network collapse entirely, and all of a sudden that could drive Ethereum and Bitcoin down uh, to very, very low levels based on volatility and on fear. Hey, but that was part one. Stay tuned for part two coming out in the future. But overall, if you like the video, hit the like button down below. Subscribe to the channel down below as well, too. And um, that's the exchange.